Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. And um, we're going to carry on our discussion uh, about uh, microbial genetics. I think um, we will be completing our section on microbial genetics in our next class. So be this class and the following. Um, so we've discussed at length the structure of DNA, uh, how DNA is replicated, and then how the contents of the gene, the recipe or the message in, in the gene is transcribed into messenger RNA and how that messenger RNA is then translated by the cell. And we saw that that ended up with the production of protein. So we need to spend a little bit of time talking about how, in fact, the cell exerts gen control over that process of transcription. And the reason for that is that there are various kinds of genes in, uh, in the cell. There are a set of genes which we call constitutive genes, which are continually expressed at a fixed rate. There's no uh, effective other, any control over them needed. Their products are used continuously and are used up. So they're pro the products of the gene, the translation products are continually required. And those we refer to the constitutive genes, you'll often see them referred to also as the household gene, housekeeping genes. So um, there are things, for example, like respiratory enzymes, those sorts of things which are continually required. But other genes are only expressed when they are needed. And this um, is for two reasons. The first of all is just to save energy. So the cell doesn't waste energy producing product it doesn't need, energy and resources. But uh, the second thing is that uh, many of these enzymes are powerful and um, you only want them to be present in the cell when, they're when the required substrates are present for that enzyme to operate on. You don't want them at continually at a high level when there is no there's no substrate from them. They may do all sorts of other damage if you do. So these genes that are uh, expressed only when they are needed. We're going to see that there are three, three major ways that we're going to discuss of how these genes are actually controlled. And the first are called the inducible genes. Um, these are genes which are normally off and they get switched on. So they are induced and they're induced by various, can be induced by various things, but fundamentally they are switched on when their substrates are present. The other set of genes are called the repressible genes. And um, these are genes which do run, which are run the whole time, accepting that they get switched off in one way or another. And uh, you mind should immediately start thinking back to where we talked about feedback inhibition, for example. That would be a typical example of uh, genes which were repressed. The third we're going to talk about is called catabolite, positive induction. And this is a, a separate issue, um, but another way to control genes. So le let's just think about the, those terms. Um, if we talk about repression, what we are talking about is the actual inhibition of gene expression. And that is going to decrease the enzyme synthesis. That is, this repression is mediated by repressors, which are proteins. But they are, in, they are proteins of, which are of interesting structure. And they are, in fact, enzymes. And they are allosteric enzymes. So we, and we need to pay careful attention to what binds to the allosteric site and, and the results of that binding. Now, the default um, position for a repressible gene is it's usually on. It runs the whole time until it is switched off. So that's repressible genes. An inducible gene, induction, switches on a gene which is normally off. And it is th that switching on is in initiated by an inducer. Now the inducer, uh, there are many inducers. They're not necessarily proteins, some of them are proteins, 
but there are other things which will act as inducers and we'll see one good example at least. So the default position of an inducible gene is that it is off all the time. So I need to spend a little a bit of time uh, just describing to you a peculiarity of the way in which genes are organized in the prokaryotes. This does not apply to the eukaryotes. In the prokaryotes, many of the genes which are linked to one another in function in a metabolic pathway or something like that, they are related to one another in function. They are structured together in the genome. So pay careful attention to this structure because it's really important. And we, we need to have it in mind as we, as we discuss the next couple of topics. Okay, so here are a set of genes. These are the, the genes which, these are called the structural genes, and they are the genes which are going to produce some effect in the cell, participate in a met, in metabolic pathway or whatever. They are linked in function. And in the prokaryotes, they are very often linked in position on the genome. So here they are here, those are the structural genes. Close by them lies an area which is called the control region. And for the control region, you have already heard about one control mechanism. And that is that there is a promoter. This, these are the genes here, but upstream of the genes lies this promoter region. And this is where the RNA polymerase that is going to do the transcription, this is where the RNA polymerase first binds. And there are various control mechanisms that bind the, the uh, polymerase to the DNA tightly and allow it to proceed to do the transcription. But in this organization structure, there is an intervening area here, and it's called the operator. And this is the switch. This is the actual switch that either allows or does not allow this, the RNA polymerase to move from the promoter forward and transcribe the gene. So this is our switch. This is called, these lie together and they're called the control region. And then up this whole area here, this particular kind of organization, the structural genes lying together with a control region above it. This is called an operon. And it is a common feature of the genetics of the prokaryotes, is the operon structure. It does not appear in the eukaryotes. Up, somewhere upstream of the operon is another area, and it's called the regulatory gene. It's often designated I, and it's the regulatory gene. This regulatory gene may indeed lie right close to the operon, but it may all sometimes lie distant from it. Doesn't matter because it's actually its product that is really important. So this is the structure of an operon and we, we need to bear it in mind. Now we're talking here about an inducible operon. And um, in fact, we're talking here we, you, you'll see that this is a model for an inducible operon, and I'll give you one typical example of an inducible operon. So this is the way it works. Remember that um, th in, under normal circumstances, um, this gene is off, the default is off, okay? And so this is how the gene would sit normally in in the, the genome um, in preparation, if you like, for being switched on. What happens is that this a regulatory region here continually transcribes a protein, which is an allosteric protein. Here it is here. And it's a repressor, it's called the repressor protein. And it binds here. So it's binding in there. Its active site binds it there to that to that control region. When it binds there, which is the normal situation for this for this operon, the any the RNA polymerase is stuck. 
it cannot proceed down and trying to transcribe the, all of the structural genes. So there it just sits. But this is an allosteric protein. This here is an allosteric protein. It has an allosteric site there. And what the allosteric site binds is called an inducer. And it's some other molecule. It's a molecule which basically indicates to the, to the cell that the products of these genes are required. So here's a, sp a specific example. And this is one of the most famous operons of all. It's called the LAC operon, LAC operon. That is the lactose operon. It's famous because it was the very first operon whose complete working was worked out. And uh, so under normal circumstances, um, the LAC operon is off because the cell doesn't actually necessarily see lactose that often. Lactose is a sugar and it's a product of milk. And so it, it actually is not that commonly exposed, but some bacteria when they see it are able to metabolize it. So under normal circumstances, they have no need for this gene whatsoever. And under normal circumstances, this repressor protein here binds here and the, the RNA polymerase cannot proceed. But this is an allosteric protein. It's an allosteric enzyme and it can bind an inducer. And the inducer is this, it's called allolactose. You can think of it actually as just being lactose because it's an, it's an isomer of, of lactose. If any, uh, any lactose gets into the cell at all, there will be a small amount of allolactose in the, mixed in with it because it's just an, an isomer of lactose. And the allolactose binds at the allosteric site here on this protein and it inactivates it. The, it, the, it switches, it's an allosteric inhibitor of this protein and this protein is no longer able to bind here and it comes off. And as soon as it comes off, the RNA polymerase can proceed to transcribe and it can transcribe the whole, it transcribes everything. The promoter region operates for all of these genes. So it runs through, transcribes them all and produces the, ultimately produces the products. There are three major products from this operon. And um, the first one to pay attention to is actually this one, permease. What permease does is it opens um, transport proteins in the membrane, which allow more lactose to come through. The second thing is um, this here, this is beta-galactosidase. This is a very important enzyme to, to remember. Beta-galactosidase is the enzyme which digests lactose. And it's very often the enzyme that we test for if we want to test for the ability to metabolize lactose. So beta-galactosidase. And um, the, uh, this last one here, by the way, is transacetylase. This is, uh, this, when this permease opens, this uh, unnecessary things can come through. And there are unnecessary and sometimes toxic products of the whole process. And um, that this uh, transacetylase uh, cleans those up. So all three of these are linked in the functioning and in, in the metabolism of lactose. They will not operate until lactose is present. And as soon as our lactose is present, there will be a small amount of allolactose. Allolactose turns off the repressor protein and this, it, this opens up and then the uh, RNA polymerase is able to transcribe the genes. Okay, so that's an inducible operon, normally off, and we switch it on. Now we'll have a look at the repressible operon. And in repressible operon, the, it runs the whole time, um, but can be switched off. So the, in this case, very often what happens is that uh, some product of the, uh, of the metabolic pathways that the operon is involved with acts as a repressor. And that we've seen already, we've seen how that operated um, 
in, in other pathways by feedback inhibition. Okay, so the typical one, the one with, and the, the repressor protein, the repressor operon rather, which was first worked out, is the trip operon, and that is the tryptophane operon. And you'll recognize, have a look here, it's exactly the same kind of basic structures. We have a regulatory gene. Here's the promoter region there, and here's the operator, and here are the structural genes downstream. So uh, if the, if the um, RNA polymerase is able to run through, it will transcribe all of these genes. If it is somehow blocked, then it won't transcribe the genes. So the operator here is providing us with an on and an off switch for the structural genes. And it, the basic idea in a way is similar um, to the inducible operon, excepting that this, uh, this operon runs continuously. Um, so in the case of tryptophan, our cells have a constant need for tryptophan, for the amino acid tryptophan. They, and our cells are actually able to, to, and in, to make it. So in a prokaryote, they're continuously making tryptophan, but the tryptophan immediately gets used up because it gets built into proteins. So there's no free tryptophan. Yeah, or very little free tryptophan floating around in the cell under normal circumstances. The gene runs continuously. Have a look here and you'll see there is no repressor bound to this, um, the, to this um, operator here. There's no repressor bound at all. So this is a, this is a the, the control gene here, right? And it's the regulatory gene rather. And it is continue, it may produce the a repressor protein, but it produces the repressor protein in an inactive form. The repressor protein again is allosteric, but it can it's under normal circumstances, it can't bind here. It's produced in a form which is unable to bind. And that is why this runs the whole time, because RNA polymerase continuously binds here, continuously transcribed. It is continuously uh, translated into the polypeptides resulting uh, from, from these genes. So this is the way, for example, that the trip operon works. And it is this, that the tryptophan itself is a co-repressor. This is a repressor, this protein. But tryptophan is a co-repressor. It is the allosteric um, inhibitor of this protein. So here it is in its active form. And, when, and where if it was bound here, there, it would be able to stop. And in its normal form, it can't bind there. But if tryptophan is present, the tryptophan will bind as it's allosteric, the, um, as the allosteric site there, and it now turns into an inhibitor. And it binds here at the operator site, and it stops the transcription of the genes, which would result in the formation of tryptophan. So what is happening? As soon as there is any excess tryptophan free in the cell, that tryptophan, some of it will bind to the repressor. And that rep it now forms a, an active repressor, which inhibits the transcription of the, um, of the structural genes. So this is switched off when excess tryptophan is present. It's a perfect system. It's a perfect system because it means that the, the cell is exerting in, as, very, very fine control over the transcription of the gene. As soon as there is any excess tryptophan, the cell doesn't need to make any more. It needs to use up what it already has. As soon as it's used up, this, by the way, is not a permanent binding. This go, it comes on and off. So the, as soon as the, the cell has used up most of its tryptophan, and we've got repressor proteins that are, are unable to bind tryptophan because they there's no tryptophan, they come off here. They are only able to bind here when they are, have their co-repressor present. 
So that and that is a typical uh, repression of a, a gene. Now there's a third way. I just want to point something out to you. Um, this uh, promoter region here um, is shown here just in a simple form, but in fact the promoter region may in fact be quite complicated. And, and there may be different control mechanisms present in the sequence of the promoter region uh, itself. So I, I mentioned that because our third way of uh, regulating uh, gene transcription is called positive regulation, also catabolite repression. And this is a, um, a system which guides a cell towards uh, metabolizing particular substrates. And it will shut down systems when, one, when a substrate is absent and push a, a cell towards um, catabolizing uh, what is actually present in, in the cell. So for example, when a cell begins to run out of glucose, as, as it uses up all of its glucose. This substance here, which we've heard about before, is called cyclic AMP. It was one of our second messengers um, in, in cell communication. Cyclic AMP begins to increase in concentration as a cell runs out of glucose. And it's a very useful marker for the cell that glucose levels are becoming low. And th here's the way it works. The this, this cell continuously produces this protein here. It's called catabolite, catabolic activator protein, or CAP, cat, catabolic activator protein. It's continually produced, but again, it's an allosteric protein. It's an allosteric enzyme in actual fact, and it has an allosteric site. Under normal circumstances, this uh, inactive CAP can't do anything. All right, it, it just it, it just exists in this it, at a certain level in this in the cell. Um, but as uh, glucose begins to be used up, so this uh, the levels of of cyclic AMP begin to increase, and they can bind here at this allosteric site. And once that happens, this cap protein binds at a portion of the promoter, and it also binds to the RNA polymerase. And it actually activates the RNA polymerase, and it allows the RNA polymerase to move to go through the, the whole operon system and then transcribe the, the LAC genes that we saw before. So it's an additional switch on the lac operon. Okay, the lac operon is not going to will not operate as long as glucose is in high levels. As we described it before, we only described it the the lac operon as operating where abundant lactose was present and nothing else. But in fact, lactose may be present in the presence of more suitable substrates like glucose. And in that case, what is happening is the cell is making a choice in a way, okay? Because if, if glucose is present in higher levels, then the, this is not going to operate. So have a look here. If they have both glucose and lactose present, the cap is going to remain inactive. And the cap is going to remain inactive. And the RNA polymerase, in fact, is not even able to bind here at the promoter. And so no transcription is, is, going, to, is going to take place of the LAC operon. All of the, the glucose stuff is still going on. So this is only relating to the LAC portion of, of the equation. As glucose is used up and the, the glucose stores decrease, cyclic AMP begins to increase, binds to the inactive uh, cap, activates it, 
and allows that it, it allows the binding of the RNA polymerase to the promoter and allows promotion, allows transcription to take place of the whole gene. In the presence of glucose, it is switched, the LAC operon is switched off. In the absence of glucose, it begins to operate. In this, so this is positive, called positive regulation of the LAC operon, positive regulation, because it promotes it in the presence of LAC and the absence of glucose. So you can actually do, you can actually um, do look at this experimentally. Um, if we grow E. coli, for example, uh, in the presence of glucose and then we grow it in the presence of lactose and we look at its growth rate we see that it grows it grows very well on glucose and it grows very well on lactose as well but not as well as it does on glucose so glucose is a preferred substrate um, over lactose they can still use lactose if that's all that is that is present what about if we grow them in a medium which has both, which has both glucose and it also has lactose. Well, what we here's the, this slope tells us the growth rate there, rap, very rapid there. Lactose is rapid, but not as rapid as with glucose. What if we grow them in medium with both glucose and lactose? What we'll see is that they first of all use up the glucose. There is no use of lactose. The lac genes are switched off and they are, they are switched off because this cap is inactive and the polymerase can't bind here to read off the lac genes, okay? Once the glucose has been all been used up, what we'd see is a little lag period. And it is during this lag period here, it's during that lag period here that the cyclic AMP is building up in concentration. And as it builds up, it begins to bind to the inactive cap and activates it. And the cap is able to bind to the promoter and bring in the RNA polymerase and allow the RNA polymerase to begin reading off the LAC genes, the beta galactosidase especially. And here it goes here. So we have a little lag period building up the cyclic AMP activating the cap. Then once it gets going, there it goes there using the lactose and look at the growth rate. The growth rate is exactly the same. There's a characteristic growth rate when the cells are on lactose. So it's a very neat system. We look first, let's go just summarize what we've done. We look first at this, operon, the structures of the operon. That is the most important thing to get into your mind, okay, is the structure of the operon. And realize that what we're doing is we're looking at this region here, aptly called the control region, and we're seeing different ways in which that control region operates. The first is we said we're going to look at an inducible operon. This is the default is off. And then um, in uh, the normal circumstances, it is switched off because there is a repressor protein that binds here and stops this from moving. In the presence of, a, of an inducer, that protein is, this protein is inactivated, this site is freed, and the RNA polymerase can proceed. So that's the inducible. The repressible operon is continuously running. It's producing something which is which probably a, con, a constitutive genes. It's producing product which is continuously needed, excepting that as if levels rise in the cell, then the gene needs to be switched off. In this case, the structure of the, of the operon is the same, but the way in which the switch operates is different. And it's different because this regulatory gene here produces a repressive protein in an inactive form. And that inactive repressor is only activated by some other product. In the case that we spoke of, the tryptophan, the trip operon, 
it is activated by, by the presence of the of tryptophan. The tryptophan binds here and activates this repressor protein, which binds here and stops the gene. If you want to remember this, this is typical for feedback inhibition. If we have a whole metabolic pathway, the very la the last product operates all the way back to the first set of e first enzyme and switches it off. This would be typical for for that kind of feedback inhibition. The product itself binds here, enables the repressor protein <clears throat> to be activated and bind here and stop the gene. The last, the positive uh, um, regulation that we've just talked about, <clears throat> typically for the LAC operon, in addition to everything else we talked about, in LAC there is a site up here which can bind an activated cap protein. And if it binds the activated cap protein, it allows transcription of the genes to proceed, um, provided it's allowed to here as well, of course. But the cap protein is an additional switch and it prevents the, the LAC operon from being transcribed in the presence of glucose. As long as glucose is present, this here is this protein is inactive and the LAC operon cannot operate. In the absence of glucose, cyclic AMP switches this on, allows binding of the, of the cap protein and of the RNA polymerase and transcription proceeds. And that's, this is how we demonstrate that uh, experimentally. Okay, so that's, um, there are various other, if you are interested in uh, gene control, there are various other methods of gene control which are mentioned in your book. Probably the most important one to remember, um, simply because it's an area of such incredibly active research, um, is the use of very small pieces of RNA, uh, which act as control mechanisms. Um, they actually are able to bind, for example, to messenger RNA and it silence messenger RNA so that it can't be translated. All of these, there's a whole suite of these very small uh, RNA uh, control mechanisms which are being elucidated in the cell. That would be, if, I, if you were to read it extra, I won't question you on it. If you were to read anything extra, read up a little bit about those. Okay, I do want to discuss, however, uh, two additional um, areas of uh, uh, prokaryote genetics. Um, remember always that uh, I, I emphasize where there are differences between prokaryote and eukaryote, but much of what we say about prokaryote genetics actually applies to eukaryote genetics as well. And this topic here certainly does. Um, there's something to think about. I said right at the very beginning when we were talking about DNA and kind of what we need from DNA, uh, what the cell needs from DNA. It needs a DNA, the DNA a message to be unambiguous, right? We need to have clear sets of rules about what a DNA sequence actually means. Um, so that during transcription translation, it is absolutely clear and produces a reproducible result from the same gene the whole time. That's the first thing. Second thing is uh, DNA uh, must be accurately reproducible. Every time a cell divides and also when a, a eukaryote cells reproduce during sex or reproduction as well, at least once we're going, doing these processes, we're gonna to have to replicate the DNA completely so that complete copies of the DNA are made in the cell. In the processes in prokaryote, this is the most important system of reproduction is a simple binary fission. Every time the cell divides, all of the DNA must divide and it must divide rapidly and it must divide accurately. It's divide rapidly because many of the gene functions have to stop while replication is going on. 
it must re replicate very accurately because each daughter cell ideally should receive this, exactly the same genetic information. And those are the processes of reproduction in prokaryotes, but also of growth in eukaryotes and of development. Those are the processes of mitosis. So the DNA always has to be accurately reproduced. The DNA must also uh, be protected. Um, there must be uh, mechanisms to ensure that DNA doesn't spontaneously change its sequence. But even a small change in sequence can result in enormous changes in the structure of the proteins which are produced from that particular gene. So any such change, any permanent change in the base sequence of DNA, we refer to as a mutation. And in fact, they are relative, believed not relatively common. Um, they certainly occur relatively commonly in the cell. I just need to just check one thing. Excuse me, please. Uh -huh. Uh, sorry, I got a beep in my ear and I thought everything had shut down. So I just had to check. Okay, so uh, re mutations do actually occur relatively frequently, especially during these very, very complicated processes such as DNA replication. But the cell possesses mechanisms for tracking those mutations and as far as possible, repairing them so that it's the, they do not actually become a part of the permanent record. The problem is that any mutation which is not changed back to the correct sequence is handed over to the progeny. In the case of, by, of prokaryotes, to all the daughter cells will start to inherit that mutation if one has arisen. In uh, eukaryotes, all the cells which arise from as from one particular cell that has mutated, all their, its daughter cells will inherit. And in the case of uh, gametes, if an, a mutation ha has been inherited by gametes, it will, that mutation will be handed on to the progeny. So here's something really important to think about. Muta although we, inherently we think, oh, mutations are a bad thing. In fact, there are three kinds of mutation. Many mutations actually are neutral. They, and I'll discuss that a little bit more. They have no impact whatsoever. Um, some mutations, in fact, are beneficial. They allow either new proteins to produ be produced, which work better, um, or they allow small changes in proteins, which allow them to work better. So they actually can be beneficial. But many mutations are, in fact, harmful. Um, because Evolution has gone on for a very long time, and uh, most um, proteins are operating at optimal efficiency, and any change to uh, their structure due to changes in DNA sequence actually are, will be harmful. So we instinctively sort of think of mutation, oh, it must be bad. It's not. It can be neutral, no effect, or it can be beneficial. To, to the cell. Um, but uh, the thing to think about is this. Life itself, uh, life on Earth rose in the prokaryotes. Prokaryote cells were the original cell. And if mutation never occurred, and if mutation was never passed on to progeny, and if the function of proteins could never be improved, we would all still be bacteria swimming in the ocean. All of evolution from those first primordial cells, all of evolution has taken place because mutation takes place, because DNA is not immutable. And these, the beneficial mutations, are favored. Any organism which carries a mutation which is beneficial will operate it slightly better than its siblings. And that slight, the, that slight advantage confers on the 
that organism the ability to reproduce more. And because it's re reproducing more, it's producing more offspring and its offspring are carrying this beneficial mutation. And they begin to form a population which outcompetes its fellows. That is the, that, uh, the, the simplest is the process of the evolution of the, the descent of species by natural selection. That is Darwinian evolution. The acquisition of beneficial mutation, which confers better reproductive ability, allows them uh, that the mutant carrier to have more offspring. That is what has driven us through all of evolution from the primordial prokaryote cell to all of the diversity that we see and on. Evolution doesn't stop, evolution continues very slowly. The acquisition of these beneficial mutations and the impact on the population is very slow. We see it not in kind of terms that we would be able to appreciate normally, but over hundreds of thousands of years. Now, there are various, I mentioned them, there are various things which can cause mutations to occur, and those we refer to as mutagens. But there are also spontaneous mutations. There are mutations which occur in the absence of the mutagen. And um, I, I would just, I think I've mentioned it again in a little while, but as far as mutations, mutagens are concerned, there are, there are two in particular that we that we should be concerned with the first is chemical mutagens and um, unfortunately in modern times we are exposed to many chemical mutagens and these are chemicals which find their way into the cell and are able to actually directly affect dna and end up changing base sequence of, of dna that's chemical and the other really important uh, mutagens are electromagnetic, um, in particular light, and in, and in the light spectrum, especially UV light. That is really important, a really important mutagen. But ionizing radiation, gamma radiation, X radiation, the cosmic rays, all of these things impact on DNA and damage it and can actually end up causing mutations. Spontaneous mutations, in, arise in the cell primarily because of uh, replication error um, as DNA is replicated. The cell does have very careful mechanisms which will check uh, for the presence of, of these mutations. For example, a DNA polymerase is able to proofread as it polymerizes the new DNA strands. It is able to check that it's putting in the correct matching base. If it doesn't put in the correct matching base, it reverses and it will replace with the correct the base. It digests out the incorrect and it puts in the correct one. That reduces the error rate tremendously, but it doesn't reduce it to zero. And error, error in replication still does occur. And we'll see its impact in a minute. Okay, so let's talk first of all about um, what happens when a single base gets changed. So remember that DNA is a double molecule and that under normal circumstances, G will always match to C across the, across the, the molecule and A always matches to T across the molecule. Um, during replication, however, the incorrect base can sometimes be put in and it can in fact be tolerated and if it is tolerated for long enough as we'll see then it becomes part of at least one of the molecules i'll show you what i mean here is the uh, dna molecule which is busy replicating and um, shown on uh, on the side here um, is what is the DNA going wrong? Here is the DNA going right, okay? And um, this is the way it should go. Here we have TGT. 
So on our matching, we have A, C, A. And during replication, these two strands separate one from the other. Here is TGT, here is ACA, and they just put in the matching basis. So we've got ACA, TGT. What, what have we done? We've taken this short piece of DNA here, and we've accurately reproduced it here and here. One molecule there, two molecules here, and re remember, it is semi-conservative. So the daughter DNA consists of one old strand and one new strand. So in our, uh, this little example that they've given, um, this is actually the, tr um, the template strand here. So, and there it is there. The template strand on the other one is there. And here we are transcribing, we'll end up with UGU, UGU, both of those coding for cysteine. So that's the normal. In this case, however, an error has occurred. And instead of putting in ACA here, this uh, during transcription, this has been put in T instead of the G. And it has been missed by the proofreading. And it is sitting there as a mutation in the DNA. How this occurred, we don't know. It may have been during a previous replication. It could have been because of damage caused to the DNA, which was incorrectly repaired. But however it occurred, we have a point mutation there. Instead of matching to a C here, we put in a T, which can in fact be tolerated to a certain extent. When this molecule here reproduces, what is going to happen? The one molecule, one half there, the TGT, here it is here, is going to replicate correctly. There it is here, TGT, A, C, A. When this is transcribed, when the template is transcribed, it will correctly produce cysteine. What about the other one? Here's our mutant. Our mutant strand reads A, T, A. And here it is here, A, T, A. When it rep is replicated, it is replicated T, A, T. And this is, a, this is completely stable. There's nothing here. Here, there would be a chance that the cell mechanisms could pick this up because this is an incorrect matching. But here, there's no way for the cell to recognize that there's anything, that this is not the native gene. Instead, when this is transcribed now, it is transcribed as U, A, U, U, A, U, instead of U, G, U. And that is tyrosine. And that is not the original amino acid sequence. Our original amino acid was cysteine. Now we change it to a tyrosine. Does that make a difference? Just one amino acid in all of those amino acids. There may be 6,000 amino acids in a, in a polypeptide chain folding to make a protein. Yes, just one just one. The impact of, of, of such point mutations varies a lot. Sometimes the, the, the mutation will be tolerated. For example, the ty this tyrosine might, might be in the middle of the molecule where it has little impact on the shape or on the active site. However, this tyrosine may be being shoved into the active site or the allosteric site or somewhere really, really important. And the whole functioning of the protein is altered. We have one very, very good example of this, and that is in the genes for the uh, protein hemoglobin. A hemoglobin is actually an enzyme, um, and it's, uh, it depends on being able to change shape in order to pick up oxygen and to spit ox the oxygen out where it's needed. Just a single base change like this in the sequence for hemoglobin actually ends up changing the whole structure of hemoglobin to a form called sickle hemoglobin. And in sickle hemoglobin, instead of changing back and forth easily, 
when the hemoglobin is in low oxygen conditions, it crumples and it is, forms a twisted network which collapses the red blood corpuscles and results in the disease of sickle cell anemia. So a single base change like this can have enormous impact. They can be very, very important. So this is a base substitution point mutation, just one base changing and resulting in a change of the amino acid that results during translation. I'm oh, sorry. All right, so here's another kind of point mutation. Um, and uh, this one, have a look here. Um, we, this is a little amino acid secret. Here's the template strand here. Um, and here's the template strand here. And we're following the sequence here. And have a look at this. Uh, you see this triplet, AAA there, AAA. The C right after has been mutated to a T. So from cytosine to thymine. And uh, this is template strand. We won't worry about how this has been preserved, et cetera, et cetera. We're just going to assume that this has been acquired somehow or other. What is the normal? The normal is uh, these, there's AUG. You should recognize that AUG in the mRNA, that is methionine. So there's AUG, there's our start codon. There's the next one, lysine, phenylalanine, and glycine, and then a stop, UAA. So we're changing this C, we're mutating this C here to a T. And what it's going to do is going to produce this. It's going to produce AUG, methionine, AAG, lysine, the same, UUU, phenylalanine. But look what happens to the next one. We go AGC, and we now produce serine there. This is a mis- sense. This is called a missense. It's what we, we, we've just been discussing. Okay. This is a missense uh, mutation. We, this is typical for producing the wrong amino acid sequence or a, a, a changed amino acid sequence. So there, there's the first kind. Here's another. This is called nonsense mutation. Here's our template strand. And here we go. We, again, it's the same. It's the same sequence, same template. Um, and we, so it reads methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, stop. But we're going to change this. We're going to change that T there to an A. And now look what happens. But T A C A U G, that's our start code. On. Now we've got ATC instead of TTC. TTC codes eventually for lysine. ATC is a stop. It's a stop codon. And what happens at the stop codon? Translation stops. So none of the rest of, of the gene is going to be, none of the rest of the message RNA is going to be translated. This is called a nonsense mutation and it can be catastrophic because it means that, that a gene is totally disrupted. It proceeds for a little while, it may start, go for, for a couple of amino acids, and then it just stops and ends long before the complete polypeptide is produced. Uh, these and nonsense mutations are very often fatal um, in a cell. Um, this is a third kind. Uh, this is a, called a frame shift mutation. And um, what we're going to what we're going to do is actually take out or put in, but we take out first of all one of these. Instead of substituting at, at one point here, we're actually going to remove um, a, a base. And um, so again, it's our same. This is our template strand TAC, et cetera, et cetera. Here's our start codon AUG. This is the mRNA. We've got methionine, lysine, phenylalanine, glycine, and then a stop. Okay, if I take this out here, if I on the template strand, for whatever reason, if I lose one of these bases, what is going to happen? 
Well, everything's going to read the same up till that point. Okay, we're going to go TAC, TTC. What we had before was AAA. One of the A's is gone. So now our DNA triplet reads AAC. It produces a completely new codon. U, U, G, instead of U, 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 which we had before, phenylalanine. Now you've got U, U, G, that is, produces leucine. Not only that, look what happens to all of the triplets below that. They've all got shifted by one base. They, this is a, we end up with a completely new DNA sequence because the DNA is read in triplets. If we take out one or two, we're going, we're going to shift everything by one or two. If we take out three, we shift everything by one triplet. So these frame shift um, mutations are very, very damaging, extremely damaging, because they produce an entirely new uh, messenger RNA codon sequence, and hence an entirely new amino acid sequence. Uh, again, if I take out one or I take out two, I'm going to have to shift everything below it, one or two. If I take out an entire triplet, I shift everything by one triplet. I would still have the same sequence, but missing one amino acid. Take out one or two, I end up with a completely new amino acid sequence. So these frame shifts are very, very important and can be extremely damaging uh, to the cell. Okay, oh, you see what? So the, the sources of these mutations were chemical, radiation, electromagnetic, ionizing radiation, spontaneous. And the last one, which I did not mention before, but which is also extremely important, is that changes to DNA can be induced, and they can be induced by pathogens. Um, the, for in various and very complex ways, which we won't discuss, um, especially virus, sometimes bacteria, but especially viruses can actually induce mutation in a DNA sequence. And um, uh, this, for example, is the cause of uh, some of the really important cancers, um, which are induced by, especially by viruses. Okay, I just want to mention um, that there are repair mechanisms. I've already told you about the DNA proofreading ability, but here is another one to think about. And um, this is one which really impacts on all of us the whole time. And um, unfortunately, you discover uh, uh, much later in life, uh, as I am, um, that uh, this has direct impact on us. This is the impact of ultraviolet light on our skin. And uh, ultraviolet light is actually uh, a mutagen and it, uh, it can induce various mutations, but the most, one of the really important ones is to our DNA. And what happens is if we, in our, in our DNA sequence, we have two thiamines lying right next to one another, they would obviously in the DNA, they would be matched with adenines opposite here. Now, and then, normal circumstances, we have many, many of these. Uh, we'll have many areas where there's TTT, 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 TT, et cetera, et cetera, all scattered all the way through our genome. And in our skin cells, our DNA can be exposed to uh, ultraviolet light. And ultraviolet light actually impacts these thiamines. It'll take two thiamines lying next to one another. It'll sever these uh, hydrogen bonds to the adenines here, and it'll cause these thymines to bond to one another there. And this is very dangerous. Um, this is actually an underlying cause for uh, skin cancers, uh, for the malfunction of DNA in skin cells. And it is one of the underlying causes of the commonest of the, the cancers, which is basal cell Carcinoma is not a is not a uh, a deadly carcinoma. It's very slow growing. It does, it's not it doesn't metastasize or anything. Nonetheless, it it is a skin cancer, and it's one it's extremely extremely common. 
and it arises because of exposure to sunlight. That's its direct cause, and it's because of the formation of these thymine dimers. These thymine dimers actually um, occur in huge numbers when we sunbathe, with any exposure to the sun. This is one of the reasons you turn your skin be becomes inflamed after you've become sunburned. Um, is because the DNA is damaged, the cells are damaged, and it sets up an inflammatory reaction. One of the responses of the body is actually to kill off those cells and slough them off. But some of them maintain their thymine dimers, and this can later on result in, in cancers. Luckily, however, we have a repair mechanism, which does go in and repairs many, many, many of the thymine dimers. It won't repair all of them but it repairs many of them. And what happens is we have digestive, specific digestive enzymes, which will come and they will cut the DNA in that strand on either side of the thymine dimer. They will remove it and a DNA polymerase then comes in and uses this sequence here, the sequence opposite in order to fill in the bases and is all repair DNA ligase, again, closes up any gaps, and we end up with the sequence repaired. But notice that this depends upon this sequence on this side being, pre being preserved. There are circumstances where it be that becomes very, very difficult. For example, if you have TTAA, you might have a thymine dimer there and a thymine dimer there, and it becomes very difficult for the cell to repair. Um, so the lesson is, as far as possible, when you're in the sun, wear the good sunscreens because sun, this is what sunscreen does. It blocks the UV light. It prevents UV light from reaching uh, the DNA of your skin cells. So the, um, the spontaneous mutation rate in the cell is uh, one in about 10 to the nine, one in a billion replicated basis. Um, it's actually about uh, one in 10 to the seven or eight before proofreading. But by the end of proofreading, I think it's been reduced to one 10 to the nine replicated base pairs. Um, that's about one in a million replicated genes. So it's, it's actually, it is very definitely present, but um, at relatively low rates. But mutagens, the presence of mutagens, such as cigarette smoke, a vape, by the way, as well, although it's lower than cigarette smoke, um, air pollution, um, and exogenous chemicals that we, we take in, this can increase mutation rate, depending on what, what cells you're talking about, can increase prodigiously, orders of magnitude to 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 3 in some cases. So there are things out there which are very potent mutagens. Now, I don't want to start that yet. Um, I want to just uh, see if I can come back here because there's one thing that I do want to tell you about. Um, you will remember that um, the, uh, in the table of codons, there were uh, many of the amino acids which had more than one uh, codon. And um, some of them had really, really had a lot. And um, I'll, I'm just going to take this as an example. Um, this is uh, phenylalanine, AAA. And if I remember rightly, there are other phenylalanine codons which read AAU. It's still put in, uh, the cell doesn't care. It doesn't care which codon it sees, AAA or AAU, it's going to put in phenylalanine. In many cases, mutations actually take place in that third base. And very often, if a mutation takes place in that third base, it has no impact on the cell whatsoever. And that is called a neutral or silent mutation it has, because it has no impact. So that is the, the, the last kind of mutation that we need to worry about. Um, okay, I'm actually going to stop there a little bit early today, um, but the next time um, I'm just going to I'm going to discuss 
uh, both plasmids, um, the last kind of genetic element that we need to think about in the prokaryotes, and then also some uh, how natural change takes place in the genetic inheritance of prokaryotes. All right, and then I will, so I'll see you on Wednesday.